Welcome to Toxicology Basics. A little bit more information or a little bit more um, conceptual skills that you'll need for the AP Environmental Science exam as well as our labs. I want to start with um, talking, reviewing what we've talked about already. We know that toxins exist, um, that basically anything can be toxic at a certain level. And a lot of times we're, we're trying to figure out how much of that substance would, re, would um, uh, re result in sort of bad effects or even death. So that's kind of the study of toxicology. And we use a couple different units to measure how much of a substance could be toxic. We use parts per million, which how many of it are in one million parts of a whole. For example, how many of it exists and um, how many toxic chemicals exist in um, a, million, a million cubic centimeters of ocean water. So we're talking about concentrations that are very small because chemicals can actually have an effect, some of them at very, very um, dilute concentrations. We could even have to be as dilute as using parts per billion. How much of that toxin is in a billion cubic centimeters of ocean water or even parts per trillion? Each of these is like a quantity per quantity measure. It's the, they are in comparison to how much of the whole you have. How many of those smaller parts exist within the whole? So for example, let's think of a cube. This could be of ocean water, this could be of air, where toxins exist. Think of a cube with one meter on each side. Answer me this. If it's one meter on each side, how many centimeters is that? So basically, how many centimeters are in one meter? Come on, people. Carolina, do you know? How many centimeters are in one meter? Yeah, that's right. There's 100 centimeters in one meter. So it's 100 centimeters tall, 100 wide, 100 back. My question for you is, how many cubic centimeters exist within this cube? How many little cubes with a centimeter on each side could I fit inside here? Could I stack up to equal this cube? How many cubic centimeters are in this? So we're going to use a little math, Sebastian. I want you to, to pause this video for a second and try to calculate that. How many cubic centimeters are in this cubic, um, cubic meter box? Well, I hope you got that. This actually makes a million cubes. And the reason I'm having you calculate that is because it, it's, it's showing you what, what a part per million would be. A part per million, one ppm, one part per million, would be one teeny tiny cubic centimeter within this huge cube. So there's actually a million of them. There's actually a million of them that could fit in that, in that, in that area. So that's going to give you one million, what we call cubic centimeters. Centimeter, centimeter, centimeter would be a cubic centimeter, centimeter on each side. One block, one part per million. There it is. So take a look at what one part per million means. When you look at this, you can get a sense of what one part per million is. So if I say one part per million, that, an example of that would be one inch in 16 miles. So that one inch represents one part of the whole, one millionth part of the whole, and the whole is 16 miles. Or we could represent it one minute in two years. <laughs> so this minute that we're living in right now is one part per million of your life for the next two years. Or one cent in $10,000. One ounce of salt and 31 tons of potato chips. Or one bad apple and 2,000 barrels of apples. So this is just some comparisons for you to understand what one part per million is. Now take a second and try to brainstorm what one, one part per billion could be. One part per billion, okay? If we want to figure out what one part per billion is, we need to take a one centimeter cube. We're taking a one, we're taking a, a one cubic centimeter block, and we're going to cut that into a thousand blocks to give us one part per, per billion. One cent, point, point 0.1 centimeter, or point 0.1 centimeter, right? Point 0.1 centimeter would be one block, or one, one part per billion of this, and that would give us uh, one thousandth of a centimeter cubed. So what I've, what I've done is I've taken this cube out of our original block. Do you remember our original block? Here we go, let's go back. 
Here's our original block, 100 centimeters on each side. I've taken this cube right here and blown it up on this next slide. Just a second, on this slide. So I've taken this whole cube was just that little one we were looking at. Now I'm doing. Now I'm cutting that into a thousand blocks. So that's going to give me what will represent one part per billion, one one thousandth of a cubic centimeter. One out of one thousandth of a cubic centimeter. So. One part per billion is much, much smaller. It's not one inch in 16 miles. It's one inch in 16,000 miles. Try to really comprehend how small that is. One part per billion is not very much. Or one second in 32 years. This one second out of the next 32 years of your life. One cent in $10 million. One pinch of salt in 10, pound, 10 tons of potato chips. And so on and so forth. Okay. So now let's try to get a sense of one part per trillion. So I'm going to take one of the part per billionth box and divide that by a thousand again. So it's going to be only a hundredth of a centimeter on each side and that's going to give me one part per trillion or one one millionth. One one millionth of a cubic centimeter would be one part per trillion. That's really quite an incredibly small quantity. It would be one postage stamp in the, in the area of the city of Dallas, or one inch in 16 million miles. That's more than 600 times around the Earth. One second in 320 centuries. This second we're living in now is not even a trillionth of your life. You don't even have enough years in your life to do that. One flea and 360 million elephants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One per trillion is incredibly small. So it's really important to remember that when we're talking about things to the to the left side of the decimal point like things that you think of in the normal number range one trillion is really really big one billion is bigger than one million but one definitely less than one trillion and one million would be the smallest but we're talking about quantities that are on the right side of the decimal point one part per trillion is the smallest one part per trillion is the smallest one part per billion is in the middle and one part per million is actually the largest of those because things get smaller as you move to the right side of the decimal point. So, and also another important relationship to remember is equivalent units. So for normal conditions, for standard temperature and pressure on the surface of the earth, under normal conditions, one cubic centimeter is actually equal to one milliliter. And that's equal to one gram. So you can use all of these interchangeably. What I mean is on the AP exam, you might see one cubic centimeter. That's the same thing as one milliliter. They're equal quantities. And one milliliter is the same thing as one gram, when we're talking about water, of course. And these are all equal quantities. So you could see them written out in any way here. Now, if, if, the, if the temperature changes or the pressure changes, these areas, these volumes can expand, and they will no longer be equal. But normally, these are equal measurements for water. That means that there's a bunch of different ways we can think about parts per million, okay? So a thousand milliliters is the same thing as a thousand cubic centimeters, is the same thing as a liter of water, is the same thing as one kilogram, is the same thing as a thousand grams. So all these quantities listed here are equal. Milliliters, cubic centimeters, that liter, kilogram, grams, okay? So when we talk about one one thousandth of a gram, we're talking about one part per million, or we could say one milligram per kilogram or we could say a thousand kilograms, one in a thousand kilograms. So this is one part per million. Same is true, you could replace those units with cubic centimeters, um, millimeters cubed per one liter, or you could replace that with, uh, with milligrams per liter. So all these are just showing equivalent ways of writing the same thing, one part per million of water. So when we measure toxicity, we're gonna do this in the lab, oops. We're going to do this in the lab. It's a determined in the lab. So on the AP exam, don't ever write that toxicity was determined on humans or it was determined in the environment. What we do to test toxicity is we do everything in the laboratory. Okay. The normal procedure is to, to use test animals like we're doing in your lab with the brine shrimp. We use test animals and we have them either ingest it or place them in an environment. So we can feed a pill to a rat, for example, where we can, we can make sure that the rat ingests the toxin. We can apply it to the skin, we can inhale it, or we can force some other method to introduce it into the body. And then we place that test material, all, or we can place that test material in water or air, 
and test the animal's environment. Now, for a second, think about your brine shrimp lab. Which of these sort of methods, which of these methods are we using for the brine shrimp lab? Which of these methods are we using for the brine shrimp lab? Yes, definitely. We're, we're using this water substance and we're putting some ammonia in it and we are exposing the brine shrimp to the ammonia by allowing them to live in that for a little bit and introducing it into their bodies. So that's one way in which we measure the toxicity of a substance. So toxicity can be measured in a couple different ways. We can measure um, how much, how, how, the, how the toxicity level affects death, how many of the organisms are living or dying in different concentrations. We can measure how it affects birth defects, teratogenicity, carcinogenicity would be ability to cause cancer, and mutagenicity would be cause changes in DNA. In our brine shrimp lab, which of these are we testing for? Death, birth effects, cancer, DNA, brine shrimp lab. Yeah, definitely. We're testing the death. Are they living or dying? We're, we don't really know any of these other things, um, which might be important when we're worried about how they affect humans. So when we use mortality, death, as our endpoint, we measure that with the LD50 or the LC50. Now, we've already talked a little bit about this. We know the lethal dose 50 um, we've already talked about this in class before, so I would just like you to take a minute right now, pause the video, and write down again, what is the LD50 of a chemical? What is the LD50 of a chemical? Jot down your answer to that question right now. All right, so let's look at that. This would be the, the lethal dose at 50%. We already know that LD50 is the dose of a chemical that produces death in 50% of a population. So exposing yourself to in ingesting this um, to a certain degree will, will cause death in about 50% of the test subjects being used. So that would be um, one one thousandth, uh, the substance times one one thousandth of the body weight. So it's normally expressed in parts per million. Part, well, how many parts per million will cause death um, of 50% of the population? But there's something a little bit different when we say the LC50. We're not talking about the dose. We're talking about the, not the dose, the concentration. The concentration. Now what's the difference here? Well, the dose, when I'm talking about the LD50, I'm talking about ingesting it. Meaning I actually probably put it in my mouth and swallow it. So that would, that would be the dose that I'm receiving of the toxin. But if I'm talking about LC50, I'm talking about the concentration of the toxin in my environment. It could be in the air. It could be the LC, the, con the lethal concentration in the air I'm breathing. Or if I'm an organism that lives in the water, I could be talking about the lethal concentration of a substance living in the water. So the concentration of a chemical in an environment, usually the air or the water, that produces what we talked about before death in 50% of those exposed. So in our brine shrimp lab, are we, do, are we really calculating the LD50 or the LC50? In the brine shrimp lab, are we calculating the LD50 or the LC50? Right, we're, we're calculating the LC50 because we're putting the brine shrimp into the water. So we're not actually... Um, and actually feeding it to the brine shrimp themselves, although I'm sure they're consuming it by being part of that. Okay, So this is also expressed in parts per million. Okay. So one final thought here before I pause. There are actually three routes that you can be exposed. Oral, dermal, and inhalation. I think you can make a guess about what these mean. So I'm just going to have you pause here and on your paper. What, what, do we, what do we mean when you're exposed to a pesticide or exposed to a toxin orally? dermally, and inhalation. What do those mean? Okay, oral means what? Right, your mouth. You're actually consuming it. You're putting it in your mouth. Dermal. Dermal. Dermatologist. What does derm mean? Derm means skin. So dermal would be exposure 
to your skin, probably being absorbed into your body. And then finally,